So like Josh said, I'm a lead experience planner. I don't, I'm not, I don't particularly like that title just because it makes it sound like I do like laser light shows or something, but I'm really like a researcher. We just can't say researcher in the consulting world because no one wants to buy research, they want to buy outcomes. Um, so I work for a company called Effective UI. We are a UX design, development, and research company. We were acquired by WPP a couple of years ago, so we're under the Ogilvy and Mather family. Um, before I joined Effective UI, I was with the Behavioral Science Organization at Procter & Gamble, uh, working on a lot of CPG projects, packaging, advertising, uh, framing of our products from a marketing perspective. He has an awesome story about Mr. Clean yeah. that you guys should ask him about after this presentation. Um, I won't tell him, but he needs to. Yeah. Uh, you can go ahead, Jordan. Sure, uh, my name is Jordan German. I'm a uh, user experience director at Electronic Arts. Um, who here is familiar with Electronic Arts? Pretty much everybody. It's pretty much the biggest gaming company in the world right now um, when we make video games. Um, and uh, I've been there um, four years. Previously, I was at uh, in a small UX agency, and then I was doing large agency work before that. So getting into product and video games is a different world. And um, how many of you guys are gamers? Anybody game? One, two, three. Um, okay, um, so what I'm going to do <clears throat> is um, explain a lot about what EA is and why we're using personas, and we can get into that in a little bit. So this is basically the agenda. Um, context is key. You have to understand what our needs are as a company and what our game teams need um, to really understand how the process works and what's going on. Uh, we're going to talk about why personas are working for us. Um, we're going to talk about selecting a vendor because um, he is our agency that we've been using for the research on this regards. Um, we're going to talk about effective UI's approach and how they, well, wooed me into uh, using them, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, and then putting the research into practice. We're going to actually talk about the techniques and the tools that we're using with those personas um, to make them successful in some form. Um, we're also going to talk about what's next, what we're doing to further that development, um, and then a summary of everything that's going on. Um, cool. So I work on two games. Um, I work on NHL. Um, NHL is one of the longest standing franchises we have. It's a year-over-year -year title. Um, it's been around since 1989. It's one of the most famous video games in the world right now. Um, it is a phenomenal game. That is an actual screenshot from in the game. And what it is is a sports simulator. It's not really the typical like Donkey Kong type of experience. It's meant to simulate real life in some form. It's meant to bring out that emotion, that excitement um, of the sport itself. And then I also work on this game, which is UFC. Um, UFC is another hyper real sports simulator. It's also brand new to EA. It's, it's the first iteration of this product. I worked on this, this game for about two and a half years. And really, um, there's a lot of differences between these games, even though they're year-over-year -year sports titles. Okay? So EA is an interesting place. It is really nerdy. Um, and that's not, like, the social awkwardness is palatable when you walk into the building sometimes. Um, it's an interesting environment that way. So people are playing magic cards. Um, you know, it's, it's a culture unto itself. This is the first lunch that I ever had at EA, um, and guys pulled out Nintendo DSs and started playing them at the table. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting environment. Um, and if anybody's wondering, uh, she is actually Steve's um, uh, wife, so there are not many girls in the uh, game industry, so that's not an indicative picture in terms of who is there. Um, and she doesn't work at EA. But um, it, is, it is cultural relevant. What's really interesting about EA is even though it's a nerdy place to work, it is really one of the most accepting corporate environments I've ever been involved in. No matter what weird stuff you're into, it's totally cool there. And if, what you got is a group of people that, for essentially, are ostracized in high school. Um, you know, the gaming, being a gamer is not a cool thing. When you think of the stereotype of gamer, you're thinking of a guy in, with, who can't get out of his basement and has a neck beard and socially can't talk to anybody. But at EA, you can get there and you're involved in a culture that is so accepting and not only that, but you found people that are a like-minded source. Um, it's really phenomenal how 
Um, it's basically, you know, they've, they've dreamed about working in this industry, they found a job in this industry, and they're incredibly passionate about that. So, um, it comes out in weird ways. You'll see uh, people with toys everywhere. Um, you're displaying what you're into in terms of anime, in terms of games, in terms of comic books, superheroes, and you're really displaying your culture, and it's actually a real cool place to have that regards. In most corporate environments, you can't, you can't have an office like this. You can't display who you are, and in EA, that's very, very important. Um, it's also a pretty phenomenal place to work. So this is the campus that I work in. I work in Vancouver, Canada. Um, we do quite a few sports games. We do NHL, UFC there. We do FIFA, which is the largest game in the world. It's a billion dollar a year product. And you can see that it is quite a beautiful place to work. It's like going to school or going to work at a university campus. There's a full soccer field, there's a full gymnasium, so there's basketball teams, there's full soccer teams, there's leagues, um, there's a full gym, there's programs, you can bring your dog to work. It's, um, it's basically like, you know, you're hanging out with your friends. Um, what's, what's also really interesting is that you can play anytime, anywhere. These guys are incredibly passionate about games and it's why they're working in that industry. Um, what this all leads to um, is an environment that people stay at. Um, it's one of the few corporate cultures that I've seen in the last little while where, for example, Nate, who works on the UFC with us, um, has been there for 18 years and he's 36 years old. That doesn't happen in corporate culture anymore. Um, so there's an interesting situation where everyone is a gamer and everybody is ultimately passionate about what they do, um, that they believe that they're designing for themselves. And that's a huge deal. So why personas? Um, we've got a lot of siloed groups. Um, in the keynote speech, the gentleman talked a lot about castles. That's EA. It's a large organization that has been grown through acquisition. So there's a lot of people holding on to their piece of information, and they don't want anybody to come near that piece of information. They're fighting that off as much as possible. Um, it's, and each of those, those groups have different goals and different needs, and they're actually aiming at different things, even though they're working on the same product. Um, so that's a big part of that. The other thing that's really interesting about EA and gaming culture in general is user experience is pretty new. Um, it's not something that exists in gaming culture. Um, so understanding what that means or the processes that are involved in actually doing user-centered design are, are pretty minimal in this company. It's very, very green. Um, and when you have an organizational maturity that's pretty low on that type of scale, um, techniques like personas are very important in some form. The other part to it too is all the research was focused on the marketing. So it's, uh, it's interesting, we, we're really, we're really um, an, a research driven company. It's phenomenal how much research and how much knowledge there is out there, but it's usually focused at really big things like how do we sell? And that's what it's really, what we're really aiming at when they're doing the research. So the research wasn't really pointing at the design teams at all. Um, really what we were doing was, you know, finding out what they did up to a point, and then after that, the engagement side of things was just kind of going away. Um, culturally, gamers are really passionate. And what that means is we get a lot of feedback, probably more than any other company. When uh, in the keynote he mentioned that Michelin was like, yeah, who loves tires? I do not think that they get the extreme feedback that we get. So what that means is that game designers are actually in contact with users quite a bit, but they're in contact with a sliver of who the users are because the most vocal um, fans, the most vocal people in that industry tend to be the hardest core users. And that was something that really people focused on. They're on forums, they're on chat rooms, they're, they're dealing in Twitch TV, they're, they're really interacting with them a lot, but those people are not the whole segment that they're actually designing for in some form. Just a quick anecdote on that. 
So uh, the way that the teams are structured on each of these game franchises, you have a lead producer, and for all intents and purposes, that would be like a product manager. Mm -hmm. I have never, uh, in the variety of industries and clients that I've dealt with, I've never had a product manager whose users are pinging them on Twitter and telling them their product sucks every single day. <laughs> and so that's why it's, it's really difficult in this context to you know, break out of listening to those 20 tweets you're getting every day or you know, YouTube comments like, fix your game, it sucks. And it, it, it's harsh, and they've got pretty thick skin. Yeah, uh, Rammer, Sean, uh, um, Sean, who's the lead producer for NHL, has an Instagram feed. And he has quite a few followers, something around 10,000. And he'll put up a picture of his daughter. And the comments underneath the picture of his daughter are some of the most insane stuff you will ever come across that has no relation to what's going on in the imagery. It's pretty phenomenal the level of communication that we receive um, in an unsolicited fashion as well. Yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely do, but it, it, what we get when I started, the play that we got was after. And the play that we got was, we've already designed the game, now we're gonna throw it in front of users and see what they say. And again, it was mostly in a marketing focus group type of environment and not necessarily like, are we covering goals and needs and motivations of these particular players? So there's not a, there wasn't a lot of focus. It was just like, who do we have to bring in? Bring them in, see how they feel about it. And that's not really what we're trying to do when we're trying to design from a human-centered point of view. Um, so we do have a lot of feedback like that. We also have a lot of analytics. So we know exactly what players are doing in the game. Um, and I'll get to that a little bit more, but what the issue is that we know what they're doing, but all the game teams, because they're gamers, are inferring the why they're doing it. Um, we, we, we really know what we're doing, but we don't know, or what they're doing, but we don't know why. And that's a big part of that as well. And just, you know, I think that all that leads to this idea that there are, they had already formulated who their users are in their head, and they've sort of categorized it as hardcore and casual. And those are the two big groups we're designing for. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that everyone has a different idea of what hardcore means and what hardcore needs and what motivates them versus this casual user base. So you, you hear a lot of conversations in there. And that's why, like, as a researcher, I enjoy going to my clients' offices and spending a week there sitting in on meetings or talking with people one-on-one -on -one because I want to hear these uh, discrepancies between what those stakeholders are saying. And we'll get into that a little bit more, too. This is every, every, every game that we're talking about in EA has that hardcore mentality because really the way they were getting feedback was because the people who were passionate about that product were the ones reaching out and communicating in some form, which is very different than a casual user that's kind of like, eh, I played it 10 times, I'm done. You know, those types of things. It, yeah, it, it's, it's, you'd, you'd be surprised how many forums and how many talk groups and how many um, people actually are more passionate about mobile games than they might be about an HD console game. Um, it's actually quite phenomenal in that regard. Yeah, it, it is exactly that. It's quite addictive and it, because it's in your hand and it's yours, it feels like yours. So if it's changed some way that you don't like, then you're going to really be reaching out to talk about that in some form. Um, and it's one of those things that I had to get used to too was that there's, um, even though it's a mobile game, it's still very important to them, those people in some form. Because um, they're spending so much time with it as well. We build engaging products. Um, I don't know of another entertainment factor, like if you're sitting on your, t on your ca on t couch watching TV, how often do you get up and go, yeah! <laughs> you get that with a video sports game. I'm playing with my buddy and I score on him. I'm like, in your face! You just don't get that with a lot of entertainment forms. Um, it's pretty amazing what the emotional response to video games is. People are incredibly passionate about it and it doesn't matter if it's a mobile game or if it's a full HD console or a, um, a PC game. So really what we needed personas to do were, was really three things. Um, we needed to align. We needed to make sure that everybody was designing from the same point of view. So those castles that that gentleman was talking about before were very important in terms of marketing was designing for one thing. The game team was designing for another thing. Um, you know, it, it really didn't, they didn't match up in some form. So we needed a lot more alignment in that regards. Um, 
Yeah. Marketing had what was what I would refer to as segmentations. So they had like a target audience that they were aiming at, and maybe a core um, group that they were aiming at in some form. Whereas the design team got that information in an undigestible format, and then really, um, I guess, designed from their point of view. It was like, I'm a gamer. This is what we think we should do. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more, and I'll explain how that all went down. Um, so, and the next thing we really need was inspiring people in some form. And really, EA makes games really, really well. We're very, very good at it. We're successful because of it. Um, what we didn't want to do was tell them that they were doing it wrong. And this is very important. What, what personas are actually meant to do are to guide your intuition. Okay, a lot of people think that personas tell you what to do. It's like, okay, here comes the product, how are we supposed to do this? So the persona will tell us how to do that. No, that's not the case. You're there because you have expert and experience. You've been there, you've done this before. What personas are meant to do is guide you down a path a little bit more, give you an informed decision rather than an intuition. Okay? They're meant to, to really guide you, not to tell you what to do. Um, we also really needed to, to define who our, who our user base was and, and how they were engaging in those games. And the last thing we really needed to do was to get some solid validation. We needed to test against the people the product was designed for because we weren't doing that at the time. So that leads us to finding an outsourcer. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting when um, I've been in s agency world for the longest time and suddenly I have this giant brand behind my name um, and it was really hard to weed through um, the 20 or 30 agencies when we threw it out to RFP like, and who I contacted, who was I wanted to deal with in some form. And what we had was a set of contexts, which I've just explained in terms of the business side as well as what we needed from the user side. And that's where really getting in contact with Effective UI um, kind of solidified my reasoning in terms of it wasn't just about getting the personas done, it was also about how we were gonna use them afterwards and how we were gonna create buy-in for these personas and trust in those personas. And that's where uh, Shane's process really uh, hit home. So cool. I'll give that Thanks. to you. So like I said, we're a, um, <clears throat> a team of around 130 people in Rochester, New York, uh, San Francisco, and uh, yeah, we had someone in Seattle. But yeah, we're mainly based in Denver. Uh, we were acquired a couple of years ago. Like I said, we were founded in 2009 as a UI firm, so the user interface. And I think as we, as we grew and developed, we realized that we can't just make UIs in a bubble, right? So we started to grow capabilities, which is where you know, I came in, uh, in the consumer or user insights group. Which one? This way. Okay. So like we were saying earlier, personas are archetypes of real users. I don't think you're ever going to be able to define personas and cleanly put people into those buckets as you would something that has strict requirements like market segments. You know, We're not talking about identifying attributes that are easily measured by people. Plus, people sort of oscillate between these personas. If we think about personas as objectives that we should be designing for, motivations that we should be designing against, we're not all just motivated by a singular thing or by a group of things. It may depend on where we are in our context, in our environment, in our daily lives that really determines what we need at what points in time. Um, like we were saying earlier, it's based on ethnographic research. Um, I also kind of want to make the point that like personas, more than anything, are concepts. They're not pieces of paper. Um, you know, we have a we have a sales team. We have uh, clients who are aware of personas beforehand, and they come to us and they say, "We'd like to buy five personas," and that's not the, the way it's done. It's done through research. It's identifying reality in some way, but they are representative of reality, and the way we get there is through ethnographic research focusing on behavior, motivation, environment, and importantly, social structures. Uh, social structures really influence a lot of use in different cases. Um, you know, 
working with video games was kind of a edge case for us. Most of our bread and butter business comes through healthcare, finance, um, telecommunications, a lot of logistics work. So it, it, it was kind of fun working with <laughs> video games for a change. Um, it is a fun when I, yeah. I just just an example is when I was giving some friends some tours through our building and talking about uh, I have an accountant friend and we were like stopped by the gym and he was looking around and he just went for a second and he looked at me he's like I've made poor life choices yeah. so uh, it's a good job to be in and it's a good place to, to hang out at for sure but I think you know coming from Procter and Gamble which is a major organization a lot of people I quickly saw how fast research can fail how fast you know, we've built this representation of reality that is, you know, 95% accurate, error variance of, you know, whatever. But being right isn't always the right thing to be. I, does that make sense? Does that sort of resonate with people? Like, you can be 100% accurate, but if it doesn't get picked up, if no one listens to you and they don't do anything with it, it's completely irrelevant, like we were talking about earlier. So I think. Uh, from a consulting perspective, what I'm looking to do is understand what does the organization hope to learn. I, I cannot stand when I get a research project dropped on me and it's like, we'd like to understand users' behavior. Well, we need to go a little deeper than that and that's what I'll typically do is go deeper and really identify some core research questions, something that we can actually answer. Identify the right questions. I think we heard it a couple of times today. Secondly, how can we make these learnings revel relevant? And that is why we look at context. That's why Jordan spent the first 15 minutes here talking about who EA is as a culture, as a company, how the, what their operating model is. All these things are important to consider. And then how will they use what they learn? So from my perspective, research and personas would fall under that. We're really dealing with three problems. Adoption, socialization, and utilization. And if one of these things is missing, it's not going to be a successful project. Uh, adoption is just getting buy-in from everyone who's in the room or everyone who's going to be using this research. Uh, they need to feel as if it's authentic, that it represents their values, their company. It's taking into account things that they're taking into account in their day-to-day -day, uh, job. Socialization. The reason personas are in pieces of paper and that they're one piece of paper is because it's really easy to send a piece of paper to someone or to print it out large and hang it on a hallway. And then utilization, actually putting it into practice. And the, you know, I, I keep going back to adoption because it's the problem that I'm most, uh, that's most apparent um, when I'm running a project because you, you sense this skepticism. You know, if I, if I come back and do a big reveal 12 weeks later, I, I really sense this like, it, it's, it's palatable, like I don't believe this, this is BS, it's malarkey. I'm gonna keep doing what I've always done because it's worked. And that's why it's hard to tell EA like, yes, FIFA is a billion dollar game, but you're doing it completely wrong and you're failing miserably and you need to be doing what we tell you to do. So if you look at the traditional approach to this kind of relationship, it usually goes stakeholder, client, a researcher, whether internal or external, and then the customer. Stakeholders are communicating business needs or questions to the researcher. Researcher goes out and collects all this information, analyzes and synthesizes it, puts it into a black box, shakes it up, get an idea, generate findings, and then brings this back to a stakeholder. Oh, oh we lost the uh, feed there. I don't know why that happened. Get the wrong button. And what I'd much rather do is partner with my clients and bring them along that research process to generate adoption before we even develop a theory of anything. So going back to EA, um, I think you know personas in particular, they should feel familiar in a way. I shouldn't be telling you about some new uh, some new flamingo out there that you've just never heard of from a customer perspective, you should be able to identify with these people pretty readily. They should be familiar. And this is kind of like the archetype of a gamer, right? Sitting in a love or a lazy boy, an energy drink, a critical component, a headset. But this guy actually exists. This is one of our research participants. 
and his mom was calling him during the whole session as he was playing with his brother-in-law online. Just ignored him the entire time. <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of sad. And I was like, if you need to pick up the phone, just because I'm here, you know, act normally. And he's like, no, I'd actually ignore her because I'm in the middle of a match. Um, <laughs> this guy's name was Glenn. He was great. He's sort of one of those edge cases, but I think one of those more representative edge cases of someone who's not 18 to 25, someone who you wouldn't find in a market segment. He's a chiropractor, and he's teaching his kids about hockey through this video game. I think that's pretty cool because you wouldn't normally find this use case. And it's not to say that we should be designing for people who want to teach their kids. It's saying that there needs to be an educational component to it. Because if you look across the other 16 interviews that we did in um, ethnographic sessions, you find that there is an educational component to it. This became a huge thing in, in terms of how we're approaching onboarding. Um, we're looking at the sport in terms of two factors. In terms of the game, it's two factors. It's learning about the sport and then learning how to play the game itself. So there's the video game aspect and then the actual learning about the sport. And that's when to pass, what position you should be in, what's an offside, what, those types of information. Um, and that's changing how we're approaching our onboarding techniques as well. So yeah, I just think that was, was a really great sort of example. Um, so I think one of the, the big things is you know you you have to have team involvement you can't it's not good enough to just hire somebody or appoint someone internally and say go off and do research and then come back and tell us how everything is if you don't hear anything in this entire conversation we're having this is the most important thing you guys should write down it you, essentially this is what makes a, or breaks a research project is if your team is involved in the research um, the people who are actually using it know where that research came from and have an understanding of how it came to be. The adoption levels are a different world and that ownership makes it so that it's successful later on. Yeah. So what we did explicitly in this case is we had a kickoff, project kickoff. Those are, that's nothing special. We ran a workshop. Okay, getting a little more special, not used to doing that. Uh, but we sat down with 30 different people from EA over the course of three days went into their offices, into their spaces, and, set, and just had an honest conversation about what they would like to get out of this project, uh, what their primary concerns are, what does their day-to-day -day look like. Really just trying to understand the organization from the top down. We talked with lead producers all the way to you know, the UX designer who's in the corner frustrated about everything. Um, the other thing that we did is we brought the Marketing, uh, yeah. Uh, we brought the like the marketing director. We brought individual team members. We had them join us in these people's living rooms. And I think if if nothing else, this took away that abstraction. That like, oh yeah, they're talking to customers. They were able to see what it means to talk with a customer, how to ask questions, what kinds of questions we're asking. They were able to empathize with individual people. Now, that's not necessarily the goal of the project, is empathize with individual customers. The goal of the project is to get them to empathize with personas and create personas. But it started to get buy-in to the process. It was also the first time a lot of those guys, we're talking senior leadership in these games, uh, that they'd ever sat down with a customer and had an hour-long conversation, um, which is not unheard of in most corporations. Um, there's a layer between you and the customer as a developer. Um, and it's usually a marketing layer or it's an account management layer or something to that effect. Um, but the fact that you don't readily reach out to people as much as you think you do, um, a lot of people assume they know their customers, but they've never really um, experienced it other than in research form. Yeah. So we had, uh, just to give you an idea of what uh, an ethnographic, well, I'll save that for later. The other thing that we did uh, that I particularly like doing with product teams is bringing them out to a site that is not their office and doing a workshop. And in this case, you know, we have a marketing lead for one game, Jordan. Uh, Ravi's a researcher for uh, Consumer Insights. Consumer Insights, a game producer, another game producer. That's Nate, that's, that's the guy that's been there for 18 yeah. years, by the way. Started when he was 18. Yeah. Um, but the workshop isn't just, you know, um, here are a couple of things, go design stuff for these people. What we did is give them raw data, essentially, on each and every person that we spoke to and had them go through the same sort of synthesis process that we would go through. 
And from my perspective, I'm no longer creating the world. I have an idea of what this data means. I know what it means. I know what I'm going to be presenting. It's sort of a foregone conclusion by this point. My goal is to look like I don't have an idea of what this means, and I need to rely on everyone in this room to develop that. And what that gives me is authentic language and words that the team would use to describe these different elements, and I kind of stack the deck. You know, I selected quotes that would get the team to where I want them to be. But the, uh, the You're objective. You're supposed to tell me that. I know. I know. <laughs> the objective here isn't to really understand what the data means or to analyze it and synthesize it. Uh, it's really to get the team to start doing this and to give me language that I can feed back to them. What was almost well, also really phenomenal about that was the conversation afterwards. So when Effective UI was out of the room and we are now at dinner chatting about what we just did, um, the conversation about users and how we're going to approach users and thinking in that form um, and what players are doing really changed and you could see it a lot. And it was brought back to EA in that form. Yep. So it's no longer research that we paid for, it's research that we did. And I think that's... Yeah. No, I think well, it, it, I, this was me. Um, so we're trying to implement proper user experience at, at Electronic Arts. It didn't exist before I came aboard, really, in any form. Um, traditionally, what would happen is y UX is UI. That's really what it was thought of. Right. And so you're a UI designer. Oh, now you're in charge of UX. OK, I'm just doing the same things as before. Right. So to really instill proper UX in some form, I have to get the entire team to think from a user-centered point of view. And personas were my avenue to do that in some form. Okay. Um, and so I, I, I did some guerrilla research and did some proto personas in the past for other projects that I was working on with EA. And what I really needed to do was get a large scale budget to do proper personas that we could design off of. And that's why I reached out to these guys because I couldn't do that just by myself. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. We didn't have the capacity to do it. Yeah, and I'm, you know, to be perfectly honest, sometimes it is better to bring an external uh, expert in, if nothing else, because the team feels that that's an expert. This is what they do. If it's Hank from research that's trying to lead this internally. Uh, who's never done a project. Yeah, who's never done it. Yeah, so these are the personas that actually uh, we ended up vetting out with. Um, this is just three of them for NHL. There's actually um, more. Um, but really, again, similar to what Anna was talking about in the previous uh, conversation, where we're talking about goals and motivations, we're talking about um, a, a user journey of some path um, that we can that we can attest to how they actually experience the game from a beginning to end kind of state. Um, some backstory, um, real solid information, and and just kind of like a starting point in terms of digestible information. And the reason we do it in this form is because traditionally what we were getting was hundred-page marketing documents, and a designer would look at it and be like, hey, none of this really applies to me. And what we can do is focus the information specifically for the designers so that they can get what they need right on this um, digestible document. Um, we're turning research into something that, that, that they can consume and use in an easy format. And that's the idea behind it. Um, sure. That's an excellent question. OK, so one of the first workshops that we went out to Vancouver to do was what I call a segmentation workshop. And it's really understanding. Uh, how we think that there are differences between our audience or our users, gamers, whatever you want to call them. Um, so in this case, it was we identified that they all need to be current rep users of the game, uh, customers of the game. They, we verified them through telemetry data and game data to say that they have played at least one match in the last two weeks, uh, just sort of behavioral stuff like that. Uh, and then we used the market segmentation that was pre-existing. The project was paid for by the marketing group on behalf of the development. I had a little bit of cash, but not. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, marketing yeah, you had, marketing a had a lot more money than I did. That's basically it. Uh, but so you know, regardless of that, market segments are usually a great place to start uh, to prove out if there are any differences between those segments from a behavioral perspective. Uh, and it's sort of a, a great way to draw a line in the sand somewhere. What we ended up doing is segmentation by market segments, behavioral usage, and what game modes they played. So if you think about a game mode, it, um, I'm kind of embedded in it now, so I don't know if I can 
properly explain. Like a game mode is yeah. is a, I would think of it, it as a, game. yeah, it's it like a product within the game that's meant to fit a particular person's needs. So a multiplayer or a single player or, I mean, they're more uh, in depth than mode. career yeah. mode. Yeah, so we, we segmented by career mode because the team felt that that is where the maximum difference would be between customers. And there's another part to that question. We had 15, we had 15 interviews. Um, yeah, and uh, in that I think we had one no-show. Um, so, and then, yeah, it's basically that's, it's one of those things where what we're lucky about at EA is that it's easy to find people to talk to. Yeah. So we just throw out a survey on Facebook and we'll get crowd loads of people that want to come and chat with us because they're so passionate about this product. Yeah, and the so difficulty the, in this case is really weeding out who's representative. Yeah, and we did have one gentleman that wasn't um, really qualified. He basically said he was a whole bunch of stuff and then when we got into the actual session with him, you could tell that he wasn't actually as um, what we needed in some form. Um, I think in general though, we don't typically have clients that have customer lists with behavioral data on it that say that yes they have played five games in the last week or three games in the last month yeah. so that was extremely beneficial to have because we could weed out people before and that's why dealing with stakeholders and understanding the business is a huge part of um, doing the recruitment session for those interviews as well you have to really understand the business in order to make sure you're getting the right people to talk to um, you got to aim that 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 target at the right spot, or else um, the the buy-in on these becomes less and less and less and less. Yeah. Yeah, and those speak to a lot of the goals and motivations of those particular players in that mode that they're particularly working in, and that's part of the, what we're qualifying is like why are people playing certain things and why are they engaging in these types of behaviors, um, and that's part of what we are aiming at, um, to be honest. Um, and again, it comes down to we know what people are doing, but we're inferring why they were doing it, and that's what this is really helping us. It's helping us jump between the the, the what and the why. Um, we're, we're running tight on time, um, so we're just going to keep rolling as much as possible. I really enjoy the questions, though, so uh, don't hesitate from answering, but we're, we're yeah. going to get into the uh, meat of the project. One other thing, yeah. on specifically around sample size, there is sort of a law of diminishing returns after around eight people. You're going to start hearing the same things over and over again, and if you're investing resources in a research project, it's most important to make sure we're getting at least the 80 to 90 percent of problems or opinions or patterns that we're going to identify. Uh, it's not meant to provide a theory of everything. I would say, and we'll get into this in the next steps, is that one of the next steps coming out of this project is to identify how representative these personas are in the market. Because if you are making decisions it, that conflict with one another, you need to understand, you know, is this persona representative of 80% of the market and therefore we should, you know, definitely not do anything that would make them mad just to appease the 5%? That's sort of next step. And we'll get into that of really once you start research, it's not done. That's the whole point. There's always more and, there, and it's addictive and it's important that you keep going because not only do your users change, but your company changes as well. And you've really got to pay attention to that. Um, a lot of times what we do is follow Moore's law in terms of the two-year turnover that you should be looking at starting a fresh re research project every two years. But I'm finding more and more and more that it's like uh, less and less of a, a cycle like that and more on a project to project basis, um, depending on what you're needing. <coughs> so we're going to get into how are you, we're using the pros, uh, personas. And uh, one of the first things that, that I had to make my company understand when we're doing this is that um, proper persona use is practice. And what that means is, sorry, I'm throwing a lot of Winnipeg Jets references out here. It's my favorite team. So, uh, um, really, like, practice is a huge important piece of this because um, Nate, for example, who's been in the company for 18 years, is really indoctrinated into a way of doing things. Okay, you're not going to hand him a piece of paper or a research project and suddenly everything's fine. It doesn't work like that. 
It's going to take him some time. It's going to take a while for him to get better at using that. And not only him individually, but the group as a whole has to learn new processes, has to figure out how to tackle new problems from a different vantage point. So practice is really important. The first time we're going to use these in the first project, it's going to suck. So what we had to really, what I really had to do was f make sure that everybody understood that if things don't go the way you want them to, not to fall back on your previous laurels. Again, we're a successful company. We do really good at stuff, um, but we really need to make sure that the research takes time to evolve to what we need it to be. Um, because that's a lot of how companies fail, is they get the personas, um, they try to use them, they don't really know what they're doing, and then they're like back to the way they were doing it before. So I want to make sure that when, when we're moving forward with research that we're getting better as we're doing it every time. And we're working on those processes and we're continuing forward. So practice is inherently important. Um, storytelling. And we can talk a lot about storytelling, um, but it's very important in terms of creating empathy. You really want to make your personas real people. I don't want the conversation to be like, what would the persona do in this situation? I want it to be like, what would Saul do here? He's a person. You understand who they are. You feel who they are. You can put yourself in their mindset just like it's your best friend or your brother. Um, and that's why we do a lot of storytelling. Um, storytelling is um, really creating the, the narrative around that person in some form. So every project that we do, we start off with a story about why we're doing that project. So, you know, Jim is going to sit down on the couch with his buddy and they're going to play five games because his wife is out of town. We tell a story and a narrative about why we're doing this and it makes a big difference. Yeah, there. and I think, you know, storytelling in a corporate setting can feel kind of hokey sometimes, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word. Uh, but if you think about it, narrative structure in general is an extremely efficient method of communicating large amounts of data in a way that is memorable. Uh, if anyone's read the book, Made to Stick, this is exactly what he's talking about. It's an adaptive trait that we've developed to communicate things. Uh, so why not leverage it, especially in this kind of situation? So uh, one of the things that we're working on right now and, and playing with is videos. Um, we're trying to make it so it's easy for people to digest this information and to make it real for them real simply. Um, so how do we do that? Um, and you can speak a little bit more about this. Um. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, each, each of the sessions that we did, we you know, recorded a fair amount of B-roll of them playing the game, doing things around the house, uh, and then we had a formal interview lockup. I can't bring 40 stakeholders into someone's apartment and bring them along for that conversation with the person. So what video is incredibly good at doing is providing an easily accessible, engaging format for storytelling, giving people information. Um, so this was one of, the, one of the videos we did just to bring the team along. And it's not necessarily meant to tell them anything concrete, but it drives adoption. And that's what's the most important thing. I like being good at the games I play, which is not always the case. EA Sports makes great games, so I was hoping that they would make a great UFC game, and I just love the UFC and playing games, and it all sort of came together. I uh, play this game like I would want to be fighting in the ring and just use length. I like to pick you generally taller fighters, even in their weight division, uh, keep it separated, and just sprawl whenever people come in to, to avoid a takedown, because personally, I wouldn't want to be on the ground in a fight either. There's a uniqueness to playing people. You know, there's a, a certain skill to playing people. You can kind of tell what they want to do. The computer, to me personally, is actually a hell of a lot harder than, than fighting people. Computers are a lot more calculated. They tend to anticipate things a lot better because they can react faster than a person can. I hate, uh, I don't like the ground game as much. I, I don't like when uh, guys take me down and hold me down and just pitter pat me. I'd much rather get knocked out standing than win a decision laying on someone on the ground. So uh, I'm definitely looking to strike when I play the game and you know looking to finish. I like to play beefier characters. Like um, I like them to be fast. But yeah, if there's a character I like to play or I like in real life, I will like to play them. That's there's definitely the case, yeah. And the game actually influences the way I train. There are a lot of movements in the game that I try to mimic in real life. One of the big ones is actually a TJ Dillashaw one. It's, a, it's called a switch overhand left. Essentially make his 
jab hand, his lead hand, his power hand, and he'll switch his stance, but he'll do it so quickly and in a way that it's essentially like a huge bomb, like, like what I would normally do, what anybody would normally do to come over the top and, and really land something like on the temple, behind the ear, to like really wobble or, or, or rock somebody. But the movement itself is just so intricate that you can go and, and kind of chain that with a lot of other movements. And in the game, I was doing that so constantly and I loved looking at it that I just, I had to learn how to do it in real life. And so when I started going to the gym, um, they have mirrors in the gym and I, and I was just trying to mimic the movement, trying to chain it with other things that I would normally start my combinations off with and kind of put it in the middle of it. And simply enough, it really just kind of looks badass. It is literally the reason I decided to get an Xbox One when I got one, because that's how, I, I mean, that's a $400 investment. That's how much I wanted this game. I, I basically spent $460 on this game. Oh yeah, big time. I was really looking forward to the, the EA Sports UFC game. Like, I pre-ordered that thing, man. I wanted that game immediately. I was really looking forward to reading reviews because I wanted everyone to love it. So more people would buy it and I wanted the like validation that I spent $60 on a game and everyone thinks is awesome. Day one, uh, as soon as the game came out, I'd reserved it, I think, as soon as it was announced, period. I went to go pick it up pretty much as soon as it came out. I borderline told people that I got my PlayStation so that I could play the new UFC game. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, th I think you get the idea that it's really good at communicating and the, the, like I said the intent really isn't to like teach someone something that they're going to apply directly to what they're doing it's to start to get buy-in I think if it if it does communicate something that is valuable that's almost like an auxiliary benefit these are real people I think is it also prevents that whole throwing a document over the fence kind of attitude where you've got a piece of paper in front of you but you don't know where it came from or how it happened and understanding that this came from real people um, and that the information was garnished in a way that, that speaks to actually who's using your game is a big part of that in, in some form in terms of using those personas. Um, so meetings and discussions. Um, it, it's, we, we, we're a meeting culture company. It's pretty much most corporations are. Um, and, but what we're doing right now is any time there's a meeting about a product in some form, you, you state who that persona is that's going to be involved in that conversation, and it's brought out right from the get-go. And again, this is that changing from uh, what I would do in this situation to, okay, what would Omar do in this situation? How would Omar handle this? And that there's always a steward in a meeting room driving back to that persona. So there's somebody who owns that persona in that meeting room and is constantly asking people to change their point of view is be like, hey, you just said... Um, I, we got to think about what Omar would do. And that focus in the meeting rooms makes a big difference in terms of aligning the entire team from the same vantage point um, and making them think from the same perspective. And what that means actually is that meeting rooms are shorter. Um, we have quicker conversations. There's consensus that occurs right away. Um, and it means that um, even in a situation where we have two disparate groups like marketing and production in a room, that they're all coming from the same vantage point. And they're trying to get to the same location because they're looking from the same point of view. Um, and it does make a big difference. And actually, a lot of the meetings, when we started doing this meeting culture stuff, that's where the most buy-in occurred, where guys suddenly got it, where they're like, oh, OK, I see what we're using personas for. Um, because they were thinking from that point of view, and the people around them were thinking from that point of view. It made a big difference. Um, sorry, I was talking on the slide that I didn't mean to talk on, but <laughs> there it is. Uh, so documentation. Um, what we do is we bring personas into every single document that we design now. So right from a creative brief to um, a user flow or an experience map or to wireframes themselves, we're calling out which persona it's designed for and we're calling out opportunities, we're calling out um, risk management, we're ca calling out anything that might pertain to how that persona would be thinking while we're doing that flow. And you can see in this one, uh, this is a different persona set, so we got Connor and we're designing from Connor's point of view, and we're pulling out quotes as he's going through this particular user flow, and then we're pulling out what thoughts and opportunities might occur um, while, he's, while he's engaged with this product. So it's no longer thinking about like, oh, they do this, then they do this, and they do this in this linear time frame. We're now thinking about how the user is experiencing it as it, go, as it goes along. And it makes a big difference in terms of bringing a developer 
who's just looking at a, 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 a wireframe or a PSD and trying to design it into the game to understand where he is within the process and why it's important that this button works the way it does. Um, and that's part of the context that we actually work on in all our documentation now. Yeah. Actually, the risks are a lot for how we actually end up testing. So there are calls out, so we got to check this or something to that effect. Um, and that's the focus that we have to make on in our regards. So perfect segue, thank you. Um, validation and testing. Um, one of the things that we always talk about is um, you have to test who you're designing against. Uh, the analogy that I use for my team quite frequently is let's say you're building a car and you suddenly test it we have completed this car, it's an excellent automobile in your opinion, and suddenly you throw a whole bunch of six-year-olds to test that vehicle. What kind of data are you going to get back? You're going to get, I can't see over the dashboard. I can't touch the brake pedal. You're going to get bad data because it's not designed for who is tested against. So right from the tip to the tail of the project, we're understanding who we're aiming at, and then it's validated against who we're aiming at. And it makes a big difference in terms of um, our iteration times. It makes a big turn. Our churn is a lot less because we're targeted right off the bat. And we get a lot less holy crap moments where we're like, this isn't working at all. We have to make a left turn. Um, and it also really iterates that it's designed for them in some form that we're moving towards that direction. Yeah, when I came in, one of the big things coming from every lead producer on these games they were saying, yeah, we do user testing. We take the game, we put it in front of people, and we make sure it works with them. However, I just don't trust the data that comes out of that because I don't know who they're recruiting. They might be recruiting hardcore people, casual people, I don't know. Now, the testing folks and the game developers are working from the same idea of who the user is. Right. Well, yeah, there, there is I, I, a lot of that in terms of tons of different ways. Um, I think what we really do is focus on specific flows based off of those personas. Um, and there, there's also, like, we're not going to find the exact persona that comes in. It's not going to be all the exact same person. So I would say I would absolutely agree for a larger scale study, but typically usability testing is run with five to eight people. So you're not really going to drive the benefit, derive the benefit of a randomization if you're only testing with eight people. The, the, yeah, 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 and, yeah absolutely. And a lot, uh, there's, there's some aspect to that. There's a lot of people that come at me that are like, well, we need to make a design for everybody. We gotta make sure that you know my five-year-old can use an iPhone, therefore everybody can use an iPhone. I'm like, yeah, your five-year-old can slide open the uh, unlock button. That's about it, right? Like, it, it really isn't the representative of the entire experience. And when you're focusing design in a human-centered factor, you're focusing against individuals for a particular need or goal. And that's what you want to test against. But typically, I would agree. Yeah, there is, there is reason to do that as well. Um, executive reviews, uh, the bane of existence of most companies. Uh, you get a guy that hasn't seen much of the project. He's kind of been on the surface area and then swoops in and makes a whole bunch of changes. My grandma really likes cookies. Therefore, everybody likes co every grandma likes cookies. So then we're going to put cookies in this particular product. And what really... Um, personas do is allows us to argue and explain where we came from. We did this for these reasons based off of this research. Um, and if an executive wants to come in and make a radical change to our product, they have to come in with real solid reasoning and real solid research to back that up, or else they're going to look bad. Um, and it's, it's that prevention of that genius design that helps us stay on a path and actually reduces a lot of our costs. Um, and it's, it's a hard thing to, to deal with because it's, it's not just about um, them coming in, it's also about making sure that those executives have seen our work and our research and, and are familiar with the personas in some form. But it, it, is, it is an interesting thing in our company because we have so many stakeholders that this is a very important aspect to personas and why it's successful for us. Um, and you, you were, uh, you were going to mention the, uh, oh the yeah. I mean, you know, uh, a, a lot of who I worked with in PNG was the design organization and this type of research really lends itself to giving those people a voice. If a designer specifies and they may have a really good reason for it, it's just not backed with research to make a cap blue. 
and product supply comes in and says, well, that's going to cost an extra three cents per line item, which increases our total expenditure by this, and there's a retooling fee, and all these costs add up, the intuition of the designer goes by the wayside in the face of a hard quantitative number of some sort. But if that designer is able to justify why they did what they did and the thinking behind that and have an objective reference point that isn't themselves, then they have a much higher chance of adoption. It still doesn't get around that quantitative versus qualitative argument, but at least they can point to something and say, this is the reason I'm doing it. Uh, development. Um, it's, it's a very interesting thing because you don't think personas really affect development, but they really do. Um, and they do in a lot of different ways. Uh, developments are, our developers are a lot of times the hardest core of the hardest core. <laughs> Um, so getting them in the, in the heads of a casual user in some form is, is a part of it. Um, it really helps us under, letting them understand real people. Um, and that's, that's part of um, uh, a practice aspect of that. They've got to get better at understanding who, they, who they're actually working for in some form because they, they think that they're designing for themselves a lot. Um, they help us identify technologies um, and assess feasibility. Um, so we know instead of really in projects in the past, what we've done is this is the technology we're going to use, and let's design around that. Um, really, what we're starting to do in this situation is understand who those users are and the design that we want to accommodate for those users, and then picking the best technology to fit that design. Um, and that's a big deal, because a lot of the times what we're doing is, here's your tech stack, now go. And that's much harder to deal with, where it puts in um, requirements and design changes that might not have been the best choice in a lot of situations. Um, and to des uh, design for uh, accessibility um, requirements. And that's something that a lot of companies overlook, and we as a video game company definitely overlook, um, is how to ac accommodate those types of users that are um, needing specific information and, and design. So what's next? Um, there's a lot. So really, we're looking at three things, research, practice, more adoption. It's pretty simple in that regard. So in terms of more research, uh, Shane touched on a little bit um, about uh, quantifying who those users are, or who those personas are in terms of which is the most important, who's the biggest numbers, those types of things. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, great, we have personas, we have data about people. It's not the end. I think any good research project opens up more questions than, is it time? Yeah, we're getting, we're getting tight. Right. Yeah, anyways, there are more questions now that we've completed the project than from when we started. But the questions are better questions. And I think that is one of the keys here. More practice. And practice isn't just about um, using the product. It's also about. Um, uh, what research and what questions we can ask. We're getting better at asking questions because of this. Um, we're also redefining the information in a way that's more digestible for our teams. We're taking what they've done and fitting it in in some form. So you can see that we've taken that existing persona and put it into our line look in terms of our game. We're, we're pulling out information that's a little bit more pertinent to the guys that are asking for it, and we're de redesigning it in some form that allows it well, you've got to tailor this information for the people who are using it. And that's the most important piece of that. Um, and adoption. So we can talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things we're going on to next is actually writing scripts and shooting a video persona. What would that look like? How easy would that be? How great would it be to start out a meeting with three minutes just to level set uh, across the board? This is who we're having this meeting for. It's also on, on terms of other game teams, in terms of EA wide, in terms of we're really the test noodle for how this is working and getting it into another products and allowing us to compare what FIFA is doing versus what EA is doing, or that it's not just all users are the same. NBA's users are this, and uh, FIFA users are this, and we can be like, well, these guys do this similar, and these guys do this different, so therefore these similar guys we can um, do a shared project on, and creating efficiencies within our own uh, organization so we understand what users are doing that are similar. Um, so summary, we're back to the adoption, socialization, utilization. We've gone through a lot of this. I think the key takeaways for me are um, really the first thing is bring the people who are using the product into the research. Huge deal. You have to do that. Um, understand that you won't be good at it right away. You have to practice and work on your processes so that they fit your particular organization. 
And the last thing is really more research. Um, really understand that you have to tailor that design specifically for the people who are using it, and then you have to tailor those questions so that you're getting that information for those particular uh, designers. Um, some reading for you guys. Um, exchange suggestions for the most part. Um, but uh, really good books that are really informative that can point you guys in the right direction very well. And uh, yeah, I think we're out of time, so <laughs> that's it. Um, any other questions? Yeah. So we're really, again, in the test and goal phase of this. Uh, so these were just completed um, uh, in, yeah, November. Okay. So uh, we're really designing the next iterations of the product for that. Um, so I don't have any clear ROI on that. What did happen, though, was we switched over from Gen 3 to Gen 4 in terms of the Sony and PlayStation products. And we took a really big, deep dive in our um, net promoter scores and our um, Metacritic scores because um, uh, really, we, 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 we redesigned the games in the space of a year, which is much more, so that's part of why we did this project, is to get us back to a level. There is no how long. It's always going to be going on. Um, there, it's not, personas, if you design a human-centered design process for your product, it should always be there and always be looking at something else and something specific and whether or not that persona works for this or do you need more research. It's never done, never done. I think uh, project length just in creating everything and doing the actual research was 12 weeks though. Yeah. 12 weeks? Yeah. Yep. Just for the personas? Just yes. for the personas. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, actually there's a lot of little things that you'd be shocked at that totally caught us off guard. Um, I think understanding that the players um, tell stories themselves, um, the way the conversations are about um, what they're doing and who they're doing it for is kind of like, it's, and it's, it's subtle, it's like the locker room talk or something to that effect, it, not necessarily like, but it, there's, there's definitely a, a feeling of like it's not my game, it's those people's game, that's a big part of that. Sorry, <laughs> we should uh, quit. If you guys have any other questions, um, cards, emails on the uh, presentation, um, feel free to reach out to Shane or I at any time. Um, uh, we're pretty passionate about this stuff and it's um, um, really interesting to talk about and I'd like to learn more about your companies too and what your challenges are as well. Okay? Great, thank you. Cool, thanks, thanks guys. Everyone.